DBZ is great, the PS2 is great, and I'm great. Put them all together and what do you get? Welcome to Review the PS2, my return on quest to review every PS2 game. Dragon Ball Z is a show filled to the brim with fierce, fast fighting, and flashy attacks. And filler. It's also the most popular anime of all time, which makes it the perfect candidate for a video game that was so well regardless of the quality. The PS2 received 9 DBZ games, and today, we're going to take a look at all of them. These games need to be judged not just by their gameplay, but also by their fan service. Obviously, the market for these games is fans of the show, so the closer these games are to the show, the more enjoyable they will be. Even small issues, such as coloring things incorrectly, detract from the experience heavily. I'm still angry about Budokai 3 having yellow lightning, because we all know it's supposed to be blue. It only makes sense to start this retrospective with the Budokai series, where DBZ got its start on the PS2. This series comprises four games that are all made by Dimps, who also make the Xenoverse games. Their first Dragon Ball Z game, Budokai, sold tremendously well, but solely because of the franchise's popularity, because this game is bad. It starts off with a nice remake of Rock the Dragon, which accurately showcases this game's graphics. This is the best part of the game, and the developers knew it because they show it after every saga in the story mode. It's all downhill from here. The fighting system is simplistic. It's a four-button system where each button either punches, kicks, blocks, or throws a key blast. I'm fine with simple controls, but you have to make good use of them. Soul Calibur 2, which came out months prior, has the same control scheme, but includes time presses and directional inputs to allow for diverse movesets and complex combos. Budokai has none of that, and opts for a system where every button press leads you down a branching tree of dial combos. The fighting system doesn't offer much for players who like to experiment with creating their own combos. It's seriously lacking in creativity, and you don't need an ounce of skill to play effectively. They succeeded in creating a very accessible fighting game, but forgot to include any room for self-improvement. Becoming a master in this game is as simple as learning the basics, and that's embarrassing. But it gets worse from here. Because of the simplicity involved in fighting, the only tangible differences between fighters come down to the special moves. This game gets points for fan service, but not for gameplay, because even though your favorite signature moves make an appearance, they are executed poorly. Despite the fighting system making all of the characters the same, the special moves completely unbalance them. Major characters will get 2-3 times as many moves as the minor characters will. Some characters have zero ultimate attacks, whereas Goku has two. That seems fair. These specials also needlessly affix themselves to the combo system. Instead of just letting you do a Kamehameha from a standstill, like they do all the time in the show, all of your specials must be done at the end of a specific combo. Now imagine this was a competitive game. Know what really gives you the advantage in combat? Projecting your next move seconds in advance. It's sad, especially when you see how underwhelming some of these attacks are. And speaking of sad, the transformations. Transformations are a key part of Dragon Ball Z such that no game can leave them out without suffering greatly. In Budokai, these transformations are certainly present, but are neither flashy nor powerful. I can barely notice the power difference between any of Goku's four transformations. And the auras, when you can see them, are unimpressive. You don't get to experience neither the fun nor the fan servers associated with turning into a Super Saiyan. The troubles don't end there, either. Budokai features what it calls the Capsule System. Every single move is found in the capsule you either unlock from the story mode or buy from Mr. Popo. You can also get capsules that boost stats or give you special effects. Each character only gets 7 slots to equip these capsules, which severely limits your options. The worst case of this is with Goku. Goku needs all of his Kaioken forms equipped in order to equip his Super Saiyan form. I hope you like only having 3 moves. But really, it's only 2 moves, because even your throw, the most basic of moves, has to be equipped for each character. It leaves no room to buff your character and have fun with customization. The capsule system is awful. Instead of reserving it solely for stat boosts, the developers thought it would be fun to make players equip moves that should have just been built into the character from the get-go. Budokai's story mode takes you, fight by fight, from the beginning of the show to the end of the Cell games. There's not much to say about it, except that there are some what-if events that you unlock on your second playthrough, which is a nice addition. It also has a World Tournament mode, which is always fun and it has a special Hercule-only arcade mode where you fight in a variety of conditions on your way to sell. Of course, these would be great additions to any fighting game, but the fighting actually has to be good for them to matter. You can't just throw in more modes if the core gameplay is bad. You need that strong foundation, or else all this other stuff is just worthless. Now, I said that the intro was the best part about Budokai, and some of you who've played the game might be thinking, but what about the music? The music is fantastic! You are correct. The music is great, and the reason it sounds so good is because it was stolen. 
In 2010, it became known that many songs from DBZ properties that were composed by Kenji Yamamoto were plagiarized. And by that, I mean stolen note for note. Let's stop and listen. I I don't know how people figured that out. I mean, who would have recognized obscure bands like Pink Floyd and Black Sabbath in such a niche title as Dragon Ball Z? The problem is that I really liked these songs when I was a kid, and now the memory is soured by the fact that Kenji Yamamoto was giving Vanilla Ice a run for his money. Shame on you. Shame on this game, really. I know that Budokai is regarded well by people that played it as a kid, and I get it. I was just like you, but looking back at the game now, the gameplay is a simplified and watered-down version of what we'd see from other fighters, and frankly, it's an embarrassment. But it gets better. Budokai 2 was released a year later and improved many aspects of Budokai 1. For starters, it's cell shaded Many colors have been corrected as well, causing Super Saiyans to look golden instead of this ugly pale yellow. At its core, the fighting system is unchanged. You still have to deal with dial combos. However, the developers were smart and decided to build off of the foundation laid out in Budokai 1. You can now perform basic special attacks from a standstill. Another improvement is the addition of these button prompts which give you the chance to increase the power of your attacks. In some cases, it's a simple rotation of the analog stick, and in others, it's a full-on button mashing war between players to avoid getting hit by the spirit bomb. It's good, it's creative, and it definitely fills that fanservice aspect. The story mode took a weird turn and ended up playing like a board game. Each fighter is a piece on the board and you take turns exploring for items and attacking opponents. A lot of people hate Budokai 2's story mode, but I don't. In my opinion, this is much better than just watching cutscenes and reenacting key fights from the series, because that's what all of the other games do, and it's boring. You do get to bring in any Z fighters you've unlocked, and multiple playthroughs are needed if you want to unlock all of the characters. The story itself extends into the Boo Saga, which of course means fusions were added into the game. This is another great improvement to the fighting system, because it brings strategy and risk to the table, thanks in part to the capsule system. Fusions take up all of your equipment slots, so if you fail to fuse, your fighter will be nerfed for the rest of the fight. But if you succeed, you will gain a huge advantage. This kind of high-risk, high-reward gameplay is really fun, and it also gives purpose to the capsule system. It also balances out some characters simply by allowing for more customization. They even went the extra step to include what-if fusions. Budokai 2 also improved some of the modes from its predecessor. More than one player can fight in a world tournament now, which makes for an inviting multiplayer experience. My favorite new mode is Bobby Spaceship, a collection of single and multiplayer fights set in various conditions. It's simply a blast. Budokai 2 is much better than the first game, but it's not perfect by any means. Even with the added button prompts and new moves, the fighting system remains unchanged from its simple origins. And even though the new moves even the playing field a bit, most of these moves were given to the same characters that were overpowered in the first game, so there's still plenty of room for improvement. Thankfully, Dimps pump these games out like a machine. Budokai 3 came out yet another year later. It covers every saga of DBZ, including GT and some movies. Big changes were made to the game, and as a result, many of the flaws present from the first games have been resolved. All of those special attacks that did very little are gone. Now characters get three moves, usually a projectile, a unique melee, and an ultimate attack. These first two moves can both be pulled off from a standstill, paving the way for some cool experimentation which was needed ever since Budokai 1. Well that's not all, because quick dodges and counter attacks are included, and you can counter another person's counter, which results in a near-perfect emulation of the show. It's fast, it's fierce, and it's fun. You can also clash beams with your opponent, a feature that forces you to do some quick thinking in combat. Do you decide to just hop out of the way of this Kamehameha? Do you go for the counter, or do you take the risk and decide to struggle some beams? Obviously you pick the last one. It looks the coolest! These are just some minor additions though. With Budokai 2, we saw how they took the original's bare bones fighting and spiced it up with some button mashing. Budokai 3 decided to go all in and gave us Hyper Mode and Dragon Rush. Hyper Mode is pretty simple. You press R2, you start glowing red, and your key starts draining. If you let that key run out, you'll be stunned momentarily. If you manage to knock your opponent away with an attack, you'll begin Dragon Rush, this awesome cinematic attack where you try to avoid pressing the same button as your opponent, lest the attack end. Equipping certain capsules also lets you perform a super powerful attack at the end of a successful Dragon Rush, which always feels amazing. This is by far the best addition to the fighting system. I like the strategy. I like the riskiness. But most importantly, I like how it reminds me of everything I love about this show. 
You can even begin a Dragon Rush just by countering an attack, which means if your opponent enters Hyper Mode, it's time to get serious. Hyper Mode also lets you perform ultimate attacks, which cuts down on the ability to spam them. And much like the previous game, you get the option of increasing the power of your ultimate attack via button prompts. Except instead of just mashing all of the buttons like a savage, you actually have to time your presses against your opponents. It feels like you earned these attacks when they land successfully, and that's one of the most rewarding feelings a fighting game can give you. But the good stuff doesn't end there. Budokai 3's story mode is one of the best. In it, you pick a character and take them through all of their major fights. You get to fly around both Earth and Namek, searching for Dragon Balls, items, and hidden events. After every fight, you earn experience and gain levels, which stay with your character throughout consecutive playthroughs. Combine this with a capsule system, and you get to make a fighter that truly feels like your own. This greatly enhances the replay value, as exploring lets you alter the story and unlock new characters. Nothing is more amusing than turning into a Super Saiyan 4 against Raditz and Dragon punching him into the next world. Your character's levels also carry over to another mode called Dragon Arena, where you continue to level up as you fight increasingly stronger enemies. Nearly all the problems present in the other games have been resolved through Budokai 3. The move lists are more refined, giving the player some breathing room when it comes to customization. My only complaint is that the fusions are worse. In Budokai 2, you would remain fused as long as this timer was still going. If you get knocked down after time's up, the fusion is gone for the rest of the fight. In Budokai 3, you have to begin the fusion dance the same way you do an ultimate attack, which makes it more difficult to pull off. As soon as the timer runs out, you unfuse, and the timer runs down even faster if you use hyper mode, so it's all risk, little reward. It's a consequence of the new refined system, and a trade-off I begrudgingly accept. There's just a bunch of little things in this game that you really appreciate as a fan. For example, some moves change depending on your form. When you become a Super Saiyan 4 Goku, you get the 10 times Kamehameha. If you're in any form above Kaioken, your ultimate attack Spirit Bomb changes to Super Dragon Punch. If you condense this game down into one word, that word would be care. This is a game made by people who care about good games and care equally as much about Dragon Ball Z. And then there's Infinite World. Infinite World is a Budokai game in spirit. And by spirit, I mean that it's an exact clone of Budokai 3. So it should be good, right? Well, no. Infinite World copied Budokai 3 but removed Dragon Rush and Hyper Mode, the best part of the fighting system. It instead replaces them with Aura Burning, which is like Hyper Mode except all it does is increase your attack and defense. They also decided to remove the fatigue inflicted on you when you run out of Hyper Mode. So really, there's no reason to not constantly use Aura Burning since there is a huge reward accompanied by zero risk. And it's a reward you'll need because the fights in this game are awful. They also remove the requirement that you be in Hyper Mode when you unleash your ultimate attack, which was a garbage decision. That requirement was the only thing stopping you from spamming your ult, and now that it's gone, you get to experience the joy of having the same ultimate attack used over and over again in the same battle. Some ultimate attacks were made unblockable too, which feels really cheap. And the health bars were made way too long, making all of your attacks feel weak. Put all of these changes together and what you get is really long, boring fights where you're just mashing buttons until someone dies. It's absolutely dreadful. Infinite World has no tournament mode. I don't know why. They could have just copied and pasted any of the previous tournament modes and no one would have noticed. Without it, the game feels bare. The story mode also got kicked in the head. Instead of expanding upon Budokai 3's open world exploration by including more characters, they reverted back to just regular fights. They try to spice up the story mode with these minigames, but the minigames aren't good. At all. There's just not much here for any fan of DBZ. Unlike Budokai, which had bad gameplay but plenty of things to do, Infinite World has bad gameplay and not enough modes to play with once you get used to the boring fights. I figured that it might have been fun to use some of the new characters that Budokai 3 didn't have, but I can't be bothered to actually unlock them because this game is just that bad. Let's take a step away from things named Budokai for a moment. Did you know that one of the creators of Street Fighter 2 made a Dragon Ball Z game? Well he did, and it's called Super Dragon Ball Z, not to be confused with Dragon Ball Super. This is a 3D arcade game that was ported to the PS2, and it caters to an audience that is used to more traditional fighting games. As such, it features plenty of fireball motions and has a more open approach to the fighting system, as opposed to Budokai's rigidness. If you like experimenting with moves and characters, this is the DBZ game for you. That is, unless you pick up Fighter Z. The game features a typical arcade mode as well as another mode called Z Survivor. In Z Survivor, you get to take whatever character you want and have them fight until they drop. Along the way you collect Dragon Balls and gain experience, which you can use to unlock new attacks, costumes, upgrades, and sometimes weapons. I think it's a really creative mode, and there are a lot of ways to change how your character plays, since with the Dragon Balls you can also steal moves from other characters or reset your skill tree. It's very fun, and it feels really balanced. One problem the Budokai games had was that major characters would always have more moves and transformations. 
Super Dragon Ball Z fixes that by making transformations temporary and by making every character feel very different. For example, Goku is a balanced fighter who uses a mix of physical and energy attacks, but Vegeta has a heavier focus on using Ki Blast, which keeps true to how they both fight in the show. The best way I can describe this game is Street Fighter Z, and I am not good at it, but it is a lot of fun to play. With that out of the aside, we continue our journey with Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi. The Tenkaichi games are very different from their Budokai ancestors, because they feature large, open, 3D arenas where you can duke it out with a lot of characters. Like, 90 of them. Tenkaichi shakes things up with a new behind-the-back perspective, which lets players roam around familiar DBZ locations during their fights. The fighting system has become much more simplified, with most attacks taking place with just the square button. Simplicity here isn't a bad thing, because it lets you do really fast combos without having to be all that good at fighting games. You can also hit your opponent in the way and follow up with a homing attack to really show them who's king. Of course, given the new 3D arenas, you can also just smash them into rock formations, which is really fun. Each character gets 5 special moves. Two of them are utility moves that use up a special blast gauge that fills up over time. These utility moves always vary with the character and include things like Kaioken to increase your strength, Solar Flare to blind the enemy, or Explosive Waves to escape nasty combos. Very good, and it makes the characters feel different while staying true to the source material. The other three moves are pulled off with L2 and Triangle and use the key meter. No more dumb dial combos. This is where you'll see all of your favorite attacks, from special beam cannons to spirit bombs, and they do a good job at including memorable attacks. Although sometimes, instead of putting in unique specials, they just include a generic volley of key blasts or a rush attack. For the most part, it's good, but I can't help but feel that a lot of the attacks are underwhelming. A beam attack doesn't blast the enemy to the other side of the map, but instead just bops them a little. It's lagging in impact. One thing that's special about Tenkaichi is that each transformation is itself a new character. This means that regular Trunks and Super Saiyan Trunks have different combos, specials, and stats. This is great and allows for more of our favorite moves to make an appearance. The only problem is that you can't transform during combat, which would have been cool. Being able to change your moveset to adapt to the enemy's tactics would have been a great addition. Sometimes the camera is really bad when you get too close to a wall, and it's infuriating when the camera causes you to die. Overall, the fighting is fun and fast, but flawed. The story mode is called Z-Battle Gate, and it takes you through all of the fights from each character's perspective. Each fight has its own objective, whether it be win, survive, or finish using a specific attack. This is where you'll unlock the majority of the characters, and it's a good way to spend time. After each battle, you'll also earn Z items, which can be equipped to characters to increase individual stats. This is what the capsule system always should have been. Let the characters' movesets be fixed, and let the player equip items to become stronger. I have no complaints about Z items whatsoever. Custom characters can't be used in Z Battlegate, but can be used in the Versus and Tournament modes, as well as in a new mode called Ultimate Battle. In this mode, you take your custom character up a ladder of 100 contestants and try to get the number one spot. It puts specific emphasis on using Z items, and is a good encouragement to seek them out so you can make your character better. Tenkaichi 1 is a fine game that has decent gameplay and a lot of cool modes to spend your time with, but better things are to come. And I mean much better. Tenkaichi 2 came out a year later, and it improves on every aspect of the first game. It has 129 playable characters, and you can transform in the middle of combat. This was a necessary change, and it brings only good things with it. The Versus mode allows for tag team battles and 5-on-5 five -five battles, and you can fuse some partners together. Combat is much faster, with a greater emphasis on homing attacks and quick dodges. All of this is good stuff, but they really went all out for this sequel. The story mode was copied over from Budokai 3, but was made much longer to coalesce every character's story into one campaign that stretches from Z to GT, with movies and TV specials added in. Instead of your characters gaining levels, Z items will gain experience and level up, increasing their effectiveness. You can transfer these between characters and even fuse some together for even more possibilities. It is a fantastic romp, even better than Budokai 3's story mode. Ultimate Battle has also been upgraded into Ultimate Battle Z, which just has new pillars to climb up with enemies based on specific themes and conditions. One really cool addition to the game is how you unlock most of the characters. Instead of just playing the story mode and unlocking them, you search the world for specific Z items that you can fuse together to make new characters. Namekian plus mutation? Must be slug. Slug plus giant form? Giant slug! This is really cool, and it's one of my favorite parts of the game because it emphasizes how all of the game's parts tie into one another. Tenkaichi 2 is a very interconnected experience with tight presentation that makes for an impressive, enjoyable experience throughout. And I didn't even get to the music. Tenkaichi 2's music isn't stolen, from what I can tell, and is a sweet fusion of electronica and rock, and hearing it makes me nostalgic for when I first played it. It's just a good time all around, and easily the best game here. Of course, it doesn't end there. 
Tenkaichi 3 came out a year later in 2007 and features 161 characters, which is ridiculous considering how much work went into each one. It plays very similarly to Tenkaichi 2, except this time it's even faster and chasing down enemies as they fly away has never been more fun. New quick dodges, counters, and rush attacks really add something special to the gameplay. My favorite addition is Sonic's Way. Yep, that's DBZ. Every character's most memorable attacks were also included to better match the show, and this is a much welcome feature. The music isn't nearly as good, and you actually start the game with 80% of the characters unlocked. This is a drag, since it was really fun to fuse the items together to build up your roster. The story mode has also been downgraded to just single fights segmented by story bits. You can press R3 at specific times to progress the story, but overall it lacks the fun and freedom the previous game gave us. But that's where the negatives end. Tenkaichi 3 features several tournament modes and it even includes this weird simulation minigame where you can train your character for several days to prepare for a bunch of tough fights. You can even unlock Ultimate Battle and Ultimate Battle Z just by having the discs for Tenkaichi 1 and 2. It also has a new mode called Ultimate Battle 100, which is just a bunch of preset matches under various conditions. There's a lot of replayability here, and that's great because Tenkaichi 3 has the best fighting out of all the other Tenkaichi games. And that's before you get into the modding community, which loves putting in new characters. You do lose some fun because of changes made to the story mode, but it's balanced by the excellent fighting and additional game modes. If I could make Tenkaichi 4 and just splice together the best parts of 2 and 3, it would be a masterpiece. Our last and final game isn't a fighter, rather it is a distant cousin. A beat-em-up. Dragon Ball Z Sagas came out in 2005 and sold so poorly that it never saw light outside of America. A DBZ beat-em-up sounds good enough, and Legend of Goku 2 showed us that they can be great. You just need different characters with unique special attacks, varied enemy types, and interesting level design. Let's see if Sagas can offer more of the same. Combat consists of mashing triangle and square until the enemy dies. It's repetitive, and nothing about it changes as you progress in the story. If you've spent 10 seconds hitting enemies in this game, then congratulations, you've experienced all this game has to offer. I mean, sure, you can buy combos using Z-Coins, but the combos are technically already accessible. All that happens when you buy a combo is that you add a finishing blow to the end of it. Why even force people to buy combos? Why not have them buy new moves and let them experiment with crafting their own combos? That would be fun, something this game lacks. As we see in Legacy of Goku 2, simple combat can work and can be fun if you build the characters, enemies, and levels around it. Dragon Ball Z Sagas has a lot of playable characters, but you don't gain the character select feature until after you beat the game. Instead, the game developers choose for you on your first playthrough. Despite the fact that six Z-Fighters fought Nappa, you have to use Gohan unless you decide to play co-op. All of the characters are exactly the same, too. They share upgrades, their special attack is essentially the same, and there are no stat differences between them. So on top of the plain combat, you have plain characters. It doesn't take much brain power to figure out that they put as little effort in the enemies as they did with the playable characters. Every boss fight plays the same, and their AI is awful. They put up no challenge, to the point where you can stand in place and still win. Seriously. The duel with Vegeta is atrocious because all he does is spam Gallic guns and occasionally make the screen explode, which causes zero damage. However, the fight against Birder and Jice is actually kind of fun because you're fighting two people at once and eventually they work together for a cool team attack. Every other fight is just the same attacks over and over again until someone dies. In the regular stages, there are two kinds of enemies. Guy on ground and Guy on cliff. They provide little challenge and just pad out the game time. So Sagas also fails to spice up its simplicity with interesting enemies. Maybe the level design can save this game. Good level design can force the player to change how they play to avoid traps and obstacles, and Saga's box says it has fully destructible environments and unlockable bonus areas. Sounds promising. Oh. Well, turns out that was a lie. These aren't even full environments. Invisible walls are everywhere in this game, sometimes for no reason at all. This makes all of the levels very linear. Also, they are nowhere near as destructible as the box makes it out to be. I thought that when they have you destroy this rock in the first level, that they'd hide cool stuff behind destructible objects. Nope. Cool stuff is nowhere to be found in this game. That's it. I'm getting the feds involved. Dragon Ball Z Sagas is an insult to the world of DBZ games, and an insult to the beat-em-up genre in general. Simple, repetitive gameplay, bland characters and enemies, and linear levels all give off the impression that they just wanted to put out a game that said DBZ on it and didn't care what the quality was. There's not a single moment in this game that I can look back at and go, I really enjoyed that. I'd like to do that again. It is a short, miserable experience that you will always regret. So that's all of the DBZ games on the PS2. My top games are easily Tenkaichi 2, Budokai 3, and Tenkaichi 3, which are stellar games you just want to play and not put down. These are followed up by Budokai 2, Super Dragon Ball Z, and Tenkaichi 1. Lastly, we have Budokai 1, Infinite World, and Sagas, all of which are not worth playing. I'd like to take the time to sincerely thank you for watching, and I hope you got some useful information out of it. 
Be on the lookout for more retrospective style videos in the future, and just keep your eyes peeled for new videos in this series. Be sure to check out Facebook, Twitter, or Tumblr where you will see updates and sneak peeks at upcoming videos. You should also check out RF Generation, where you will find an exclusive blog for this series where I talk a little bit more about these games. It's also a great form for video game collecting. Have a good day.